In North Carolina, the home of a prominent couple becomes an unlikely scene of terrible bloodshed. Across the country, a California woman vanishes, worrying her family and the investigators trying to find her. In a violent crime's aftermath, a spray of blood is sometimes the only clue to what happened. When nobody's talking, investigators must decipher cryptic answers written in blood. Durham, North Carolina. In the early morning hours of December 9th, 2001, a 911 operator at Durham Police Headquarters received a frantic call from a man named Michael Peterson. Peterson told her his wife had fallen down the stairs. She was unconscious, but still breathing. He pleaded with them to hurry. The operator dispatched an ambulance and patrol officers right away. The EMT crew arrived in minutes. In a second 911 call, Mr. Peterson had said his wife had stopped breathing. Inside, the EMTs found Michael Peterson distraught, standing over his wife. He said he found her like this. They moved him away so they could attend to her lost a lot of blood. They found no pulse, no sign of breathing. Kathleen Peterson was dead. Crime scene technicians were called in. They were careful not to track anything into the area. The site of every unexpected death must be treated as a crime scene. The technicians photographed the body to document its placement and condition. They noticed a bloody footprint on the woman's calf. The technicians recorded every detail since anything can become important later. When they were finished, they removed the body. Durham Police Sergeant Terry Wilkins worked the scene. What I noticed was what appeared to be an unusually large amount of blood for someone to have fallen down the stairs. I've witnessed people that have had fall injuries, and I've never in 18 years of law enforcement experience seen that much blood from an accidental fall. Michael Peterson explained what happened earlier that night. There are a few things that we need he and Kathleen watched a movie and drank some wine. He thought she went to bed while he sat outside by the pool. When he came in, he found her at the bottom of the stairs. Though the death was called in as an accidental fall, Durham Police Homicide Detective Art Holland was assigned the case. It's routine for us to uh, respond to death investigations where there may be uh, suspicions or possibly uh, foul play involved. Check her out. She is in fact deceased. Unusual situation in that there's an extreme amount of blood in the stairway. Sergeant Wilkins briefed the detective about what they knew so far. She did have a large amount of blood on her person, on the bottom of her feet, on the floor, under, beside her, on the walls. On the steps, there was spatter on the walls that was uh, very concerning. Because of the amount of blood, Holland's instinct told him it was more than a simple accident. If so, they would have to prove it. Our crime scene technicians started photographing, videotaping, measuring uh, the scene, which is a very time-consuming process. They noted the placement and condition of anything that might help explain what happened that night. 
the technicians found two wine glasses in the kitchen. This fit with Michael's story that he and Kathleen shared a bottle of wine. They also found traces of blood on the cabinet where other wine glasses were kept and documented it. The blood throughout the house might be the best clue as to what happened. The investigators wanted a specialist to process it all. One of our forensic technicians contacted the State Bureau of Investigation and requested their assistance uh, to come to a blood spatter interpretation. While they waited for the blood spatter expert, the investigators continued the search of the house. If it turned out to be a homicide, the mundane could become critical. From Michael Peterson's desk, they confiscated files, email printouts, floppy disks, CDs, and his personal computer. Anything that might contain useful information. That afternoon, several hours into the processing, Special Agent Dwayne Deaver of the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation arrived. Investigators hoped the blood spatter expert would be able to tell them if it was an accident or murder. An accident is going to uh, produce a certain type of stain. Uh, it's going to be of a certain height. It's going to be of a certain quantity. And so we would look at that first. Uh, are those things present? Do they look that way? Hey, how you doing? What have you got? Immediately, Deaver saw signs of trouble. Smaller drops of blood mean more force was used to spray them out. In this case, the drops were very small. Those impacts had been very forceful, much more forceful, in my opinion, than uh, would have occurred from a fall. Deaver needed to establish where Kathleen was when she started to bleed. From the shape of the drops, he first determined the angle at which the blood hit the wall. Take a look at that kitchen. He then used strings to mark the direction the blood traveled through space. All right, the point where the strings intersected uh, was where the impact out. occurred. Wherever it is, I found points of blood. origin off the surface uh, out in space, and uh, that was inconsistent to me with a fall. There was something else. I found a transfer stain on the step right above her, where her body had been, that showed that an object that, to me, had a hook on it had been placed on that step. Perhaps that was an object used to, um, to strike the victim. As far as the blood evidence was concerned, someone killed Kathleen Peterson. At the medical examiner's office, Dr. Deborah Radish conducted an autopsy finding seven head wounds. She had lacerations um, close to the top of her head, um, at the bottom of her head, near, near her, the top of her neck. Yes. The doctor concluded Mrs. Peterson had been beaten multiple times with a cylindrical blunt object, light enough not to cause skull fractures. It was my opinion that her death was not a, as a result of falling down the stairs, and in fact, if this woman had been found anywhere else except at the bottom of a flight of stairs, there would be no question in people's minds but that she had been beaten. At Durham Police Headquarters, a task force formed. The Petersons were a prominent couple in the community and police anticipated the media scrutiny would be intense. But that would not affect the professionals working the case. My main concern was that the investigation was done appropriate and done right. As far as it being high profile, uh, that didn't bother me, and I don't think it, it bothered other officers. They believed Kathleen Peterson was killed. Michael Peterson was the prime suspect but they did not want to make an arrest until they had a solid case. The Durham investigators were determined to solve the crime 
and bring the person responsible to justice. Kathleen Peterson and her grieving family deserved it. In December 2001, Durham, North Carolina authorities were trying to find the truth behind the death of Kathleen Peterson. Kathleen's husband, Michael Peterson, claimed he found her at the bottom of the stairs in their home. But police believed she was beaten to death. At the State Bureau of Investigation Laboratory, forensics experts examined the evidence recovered from the Peterson house. Michael had said he and his wife shared a bottle of wine the evening before her death. Police had found two wine glasses on the kitchen counter. The examiner processed both glasses for fingerprints. Yet only one revealed latent prints. The other was clean. The examiner lifted the prints for comparison against those of the Petersons. Checking the prints from the wine glass against the set of prints taken from Kathleen's body, the examiner found no match. But when compared to Michael Peterson's fingerprints, they matched. Investigators wondered if Michael had staged the wine glasses on the counter after Kathleen was dead to support his story. Detective Art Holland recalled the state of one cabinet door in the kitchen. That cabinet door did have blood on it, which would make you think that you know, why would there be blood on that cabinet if somebody didn't go in there after somebody was bleeding and, and get that glass and set it out? Police suspected Kathleen's husband, Michael, was involved. If so, they needed to find a motive. They started with a phone records check. Detective Holland ran the check to try to determine when Kathleen last spoke with someone other than her husband. We were able to determine that she was in fact alive at approximately uh, 11 p.m. that night because she had made a phone call to a, a, a co-worker. Police interviewed that co-worker to see if she could provide them with any additional information. The woman told police Kathleen called because she needed a document for a meeting the following day and asked the co-worker to email it to her. But since she was not at the office, Kathleen asked that it be sent to Michael's email address at home. Investigators wondered if Kathleen saw something else when she got the mail on her husband's computer. They sent the computer to analyst Todd Markley at CompuSleuth, a private forensic computer firm in Westerville, Ohio. Immediately, Markley saw that someone had erased many files from the hard drive the night of Kathleen's death. But that did not stop the analyst from finding those files. The computer doesn't actually destroy anything. It, it puts it in to be recycled. And uh, that information is easy to find on the hard drive if you know where to look. Markley discovered a history of thousands of pornographic websites visited and hundreds of photographs downloaded. He also found sexually graphic emails between Michael Peterson and a prostitute. Some of the emails were fairly explicit about uh, what sorts of activities that they could do when they they met up and how much it was going to cost. Police wondered if Kathleen okay. had stumbled across the emails that night and confronted Michael about them. Markley also found emails that indicated the Petersons were in financial trouble. There were a fair number of emails that we discovered that uh, talked about finances and money, asking friends for money. Peterson had even tried to cash out one of Kathleen's life insurance policies so he could receive the money that had accrued. Authorities needed to know more about the Peterson's financial status. Officers visited Kathleen's place of work and spoke to the human resources director there. She told them Kathleen was a valued executive, but because of company-wide downsizing, she was on the possible layoff list. We went there to get records, her employment records, life insurance records, to see 
if there was something in those records that would give Michael Peterson a reason to take our life. And we did find just that. Kathleen had a life insurance policy that paid out $1.4 million if she died in an accident. It was a powerful financial motive. Yet if Michael Peterson had killed his wife, police needed to know what kind of weapon he used. You know, we searched that house from the attic to the basement. We did grid searches of the outside, try to locate any type of instrument that could have caused uh, the blunt force trauma to Kathleen's head. They found nothing that matched the hook-shaped blood stain on the stairs. The investigation stalled. Police were becoming concerned that without the murder weapon, they might never solve this case. Then, the information they so desperately sought came to them. Kathleen's sister asked to talk with the detectives. She said the family had some information the police should know about. The sister told Detective Holland she had bought a distinctive fireplace tool called a blowpoke for everyone in the family years earlier. She had used the one at Kathleen's house just a few weeks before her sister's death to stoke a fire. But now, it was gone. She had a blowpoke uh, exactly like the one that she gave uh, her sister Kathleen. And she wanted to, for me to see exactly what this instrument looked like and take it to the medical examiner's office to show it to the doctors there to see if it was possible that this type of instrument could have caused the, the trauma to Kathleen's head. The medical examiner, Dr. Deborah Radish, had already determined that the wounds were caused by a cylindrical, blunt object. And the blowpoke fit that description. What was interesting about the blowpoke was that it was not as heavy as, say, a regular fireplace poker. It had a thick brass wall, but it was hollow on the inside. And that could explain, in this particular case, why the lacerations of the scalp were so severe, but why she suffered no skull fractures. Authorities knew they were getting close. But at the State Bureau of Investigation lab, Special Agent Dwayne Deaver and other experts still had work to do. They next examined the clothing the Petersons wore on the night Kathleen died. They wanted to know if blood stain patterns on the clothing further supported their theory that Michael Peterson beat Kathleen to death. The team checked the shorts Michael had on when police arrived, looking for the distinctive spatter a beating would create. When I looked at Michael Peterson's shorts, those impact spatters were there, in the crotch, on the inside of the leg of the pants, uh, even having traveled and gotten on the inside of the pants first. That is an in indication that the person wearing the shorts was standing over a source of blood uh, at the time that it was impacted. They also wanted to compare the shoes to the bloody tread mark found on the back of Kathleen's pants. Using fingerprint powder and electrostatic contact sheets, they made a print of the bottom of the shoes. Comparing it to the mark on the pants, they found an exact match. Now this indicates that she is face down. Uh, the, the blood spatters on the front of her pants indicate that she's face up. She was beaten in several different positions over a period of time. At one time, she uh, appeared to be on her hands and knees, uh, at one time on her back, at one time in a crouch position as if she were trying to, to go up the stairwell. It had been a prolonged attack, brutal and bloody, one that Michael Peterson denied ever happened but one all the evidence pointed toward. Still, investigators needed to prove it in court. After the death of Kathleen Peterson in Durham, North Carolina, two very different stories emerged regarding the night of December 9th, 2001. Kathleen's husband, Michael Peterson, claimed that they had a normal night. Police were told the couple shared a bottle of wine and enjoyed a quiet, romantic evening like they had so many times before. 
Michael suggested to police perhaps Kathleen had more to drink than he thought, and that maybe she was drunk when she fell down the stairs. But only his prints were on the wine glasses. Durham authorities had a different version of what happened. They believed Michael Peterson brutally beat his wife to death with a fireplace blowpoke. At the State Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab, Special Agent Dwayne Deaver conducted a series of experiments using goat's blood to try to duplicate the blood spatter he found at the scene. We went back and looked at, um, at falls, uh, exaggerated falls from heights of 12 feet with a person who was already bloody for some reason. And we looked at those scenarios to see what kind of patterns would be produced and if they were comparable to the patterns that we saw on the walls. And uh, we did not find any fall uh, type actions that could produce the things that we saw in this uh, particular case. Then, Deaver tried to duplicate the blood spatter by mimicking a beating death. Dressed in clothes similar to those worn by Michael Peterson, he placed the goat's blood on a sponge, then struck it with a blowpoke. He found the action produced blood spatter very similar to the patterns found in the home and on the clothing. Careful forensic analysis of the blood stains on the clothing, the walls, on everyone's clothing that was involved showed that this was not a fall, that in fact the individual had been beaten severely over a period of time in different positions and by the individual that told us that it was an accident. During a two-month trial in 2003, District Attorney Jim Harden explained to a jury what the evidence showed happened that night. It was very clear that he was attempting to engage in extramarital affairs. We presented a strong case that she found out about his attempt to engage in an extramarital relationship. I personally believe that uh, she confronted him about it, and because of the uh, conflict in the family revolving around uh, Miss Peterson's jeopardy of losing her job, the financial situation that they had placed themselves in, I think that it was a trigger, it was a catalyst, and I think Mr. Peterson lost his temper and and beat her to death and then attempted to cover it up. Michael Peterson believed he stood to make $1.4 million from his wife's death. But what he received was life in prison. The importance of the forensic evidence in this case cannot be overemphasized. Had it not been for the quick thinking of several of the folks at the scene initially to bring a blood spatter expert to that location while we had the house in our custody. Uh, I don't know that we would have gotten this result. Careful blood stain analysis finally brought answers to the family of Kathleen Peterson. Across the country, another woman's family faced terrifying questions of their own. Lodi, California, a small city nestled in the San Joaquin Valley, south of Sacramento. Lodi sees fewer than five murders per year, so most citizens feel safe. But on December 17, 1990, Lodi resident Charles Abbott was growing concerned. He couldn't find his wife. A man had phoned him hours earlier, saying he found Susan Abbott's purse. Charles retrieved the purse, then called friends and family members. No one had heard from Susan that day. Her sister wanted Charles to call police. What a 911, what's your emergency? Uh -huh. The 9-1-1 operator took down the relevant information and dispatched a patrol officer to the Abbott house. The officer arrived just as Susan's sister was pulling up. Charles had asked her to come. He was worried about Susan. The close-knit family always stuck together. Charles said he called Susan's work. She had not shown up that morning. The officer asked when Charles last saw his wife. Charles explained it was around 8 o'clock that morning. 
His truck was in the shop for repairs, so Susan drove him to work. They left the house a little before eight. She dropped him off, and he assumed she continued on to the hospital where she worked. His truck would be ready that afternoon, so she did not plan to pick him up. Everything seemed fine when he last saw her. Charles said when he came home that afternoon, he got the call from the man who found Susan's purse. And that's not like her. He went to the man's house to pick it up. The man said he found it in a dumpster behind a local Mexican restaurant. Susan's credit cards and a large amount of cash were missing. They had just sold a car, and Susan had $4,000 with her, which she was going to deposit that day. They could not think of a reason why Susan would want to leave. At the officer's request, Charles gave him a recent photo of Susan. He said that day she was actually wearing the same sweater as she was in the picture. By the next morning, there was still no word from Susan Abbott. Hey, Bill. And Detective Sergeant Bill Barry was assigned the case. He knew it was possible Susan simply left. Seems kind of hinky to me. That's why I want to talk to you. But if so, he still had to find her to let her family know she was safe. People do walk away from their lives. Sometimes there's a mental health issue. Sometimes they are unhappy with their lives. Sometimes there's something going on we don't know about. But what you hope for is that you're going to find them OK. Sergeant Barry began a routine missing persons investigation. We gather basic information about someone who's missing, their physical description, height, weight, date of birth, the car that the missing person may have been last seen in or was associated with. We immediately get a bulletin out to law enforcement agencies in the area, along with our officers who are on the street. To follow up on the purse, an officer went to interview the man who reportedly found it. He confirmed that he found the purse in a restaurant's dumpster while he was salvaging cardboard. There was no money and no credit cards inside. He saw Susan's ID and called to return it. The officer took down the name of the restaurant where the dumpster was. The man had no criminal record, and a later search of his property yielded no clues. Police believed his story. The dumpster was impounded, and Sergeant Barry and other officers began showing the missing woman's photo around the strip mall near the Mexican restaurant. Because of the circumstances, you are worried that some harm has come to this person. You want to do your best to try to locate them, get them recovered, get, back, get them back with people who love them. Some clerks recognized Susan as a regular customer, but no one reported seeing her recently. The case grew more ominous with the next lead. Susan's van had been found in a parking lot several miles from the Abbott house. On my way down there, I was hoping that what it would do is provide some indication as to what happened to her, something that would lead us to her. I didn't know what to anticipate, but I was at least hopeful that we might find something. Looks like you got it, huh? Yeah, there, you go. hey, there was no sign of Susan Abbott. The van was parked and locked next to a bank near an ATM. The bank was closed. The, uh, no, there was no one around the vehicle. It was just parked normally as if somebody had parked it there and gone into the bank but just never came back. Charles Abbott made the discovery along with two friends. They told me that they had gone out driving around after making the initial report to the officer to try to locate Susan's car. Charles said he'd remembered that Susan had about $4,000 in cash that she was going to take to the bank that day, so he decided to go by the bank and see if her car was there. 
The men said they had not touched the van. The car was clean, sitting by itself, no disturbance to it. Looked like it had just come off a used car lot. Barry prepared it to be towed to the police impound yard. One thing that did stand out in the vehicle was uh, two boxes of plastic trash bags in the back seat. One of them was opened. Uh, we didn't know what those connected to at that point. And we thought that odd, given the general absence of any contents in the car. It was possible someone had seen Susan with the cash and abducted her from the bank. Police hoped some evidence inside the vehicle would help explain what happened and tell them where Susan Abbott was so they could find her and bring her back to her family. On December 17, 1990, 35-year-old Susan Abbott was reportedly last seen dropping her husband off at work in Lodi, California. That afternoon, a man found her empty purse in a dumpster. And the next day, her husband discovered her van abandoned near a bank. Recovering the purse and vehicle was a bad sign for Detective Sergeant Bill Barry. Under ordinary circumstances, someone just doesn't throw their purse away in a garbage dumpster, doesn't just leave their car parked at a bank and walk away from those things. It's possible, but it's unlikely. And at that point, we were concerned that Susan may be the victim of foul play. Investigators went back to the Abbott house. They needed more information from Charles. Hi, Mr. Abbott. Hi, Detective Barry. Remember me from last Perhaps there were answers in the details of Susan's last known actions. Charles told the detective about the money Susan had with her. But Charles said the last time he saw her was when she dropped him off at work. He did not think anyone else knew about the money and could not think of anyone who would want to harm Susan. Then, two days after Susan Abbott disappeared, investigators' fears came true. Sergeant Barry. On December 19th, Sergeant Barry received a call from the San Joaquin Sheriff's Department. Someone okay. had found a body. Lodi detectives responded to a railroad trestle in rural San Joaquin County. 20 miles outside of Lodi. The initial clothing description matched what Susan was wearing. When we arrived here, we were briefed by uh, the detectives from the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Department. They had taken photographs of her face. We compared those to the uh, photograph that had been given us by Charles, and it was obvious that this was one and the same person. A man dumping some tires had found her. He had not seen anyone around. With no witnesses, they had to read the scene for clues. The victim, Susan Avid, was laying on her back at the bottom of this railroad trestle. Her arms were folded up slightly. Her, her legs were slightly bent, so it indicated to us she'd been in a confined space when she went into rigor. She had a head injury that appeared to be a gunshot wound, but there was little blood, itself a clue for Lodi homicide detective Stephen Price. Considering the injury, the clothing was very clean. Um, her body and facial area appeared to be very clean. If she had been murdered at this scene, um, there would have been a lot of blood that would have been consistent with the type of injury. There's very little blood in the area, so it would indicate to me that the murder occurred somewhere else. We began doing a thorough grid-type search, looking for any evidence that's, that might be present in the area, um, not just at the, body, the location of the uh, victim, but also um, on the ingress or exit uh, routes. There were no discernible footprints or tire tracks. We found no indications of a struggle, no shell casings, no other evidence at the scene. She had been carried out there carefully and placed on the ground. The body was removed for autopsy. We knew that it would have been very difficult for someone to have placed Susan's body in its location by themselves. Carrying her to that location, putting her down, would have been difficult for one person. Also, somebody had to drop Susan's vehicle off at outside the bank. 
and we, we knew that these things indicated that there was a likelihood of, uh, of a second individual. The investigation shifted immediately. Once you know you have a murder, obviously the investigation kicks up into high gear. We put all of the, the resources that we had available into working this case. It's very critical in the first few days of a murder case that you work all the available leads. Police needed to do a more thorough interview with Charles, routine for a murder investigation. Her husband is a natural suspect. The person who last saw her is a natural suspect. In this case, they were the same person, Charles Abbott. You need to ask questions about um, whether there has been uh, uh, domestic disturbances. Had they argued recently? Uh, were, were there disagreements about money? Things that might play into a motivation for murder. Charles said he and Susan had been getting along fine. No financial trouble, no marital problems. The detective asked about weapons, and Charles said he had two rifles and a 22 caliber pistol. We talked to Charles about what his activities were the day Susan went missing. They needed to create a minute-by-minute -minute timeline. She had dropped him off at the storage unit where he operated his electrician business. He went into his storage unit, arranged some materials that he was going to use during the day, and then walked to an auto body shop where his truck was being repaired. He learned his truck would not be ready for several hours. He rented a car, and then he went about doing some of his jobs. Then ultimately he brought the rental car back to the rental car company, dropped it off, and was taken back over to the auto body shop where he picked up his truck. From there, he went home. The detectives noted the time and place of each step. While the interview continued, the autopsy began. Pathologist Bill Maduros led the post-mortem examination. He determined the cause of death was a gunshot wound to the head. The doctor noted something odd. There was almost no blood left in the body, yet her clothing was clean. So I suspect that uh, she wasn't wearing this clothing when she was shot. Her skin was clean, too. Not only was she redressed, but probably washed and cleaned up. This was very unusual for a murder. Checking the skin around the entrance wound, the pathologist determined it had been an execution. I'm not an expert on guns, but I, I can safely say it was larger than a 22. Investigators believe the murder weapon was a 357 or 38 caliber handgun. But no evidence suggested who fired it. While the autopsy was being conducted, police continued to look at Charles Abbott. Sergeant Barry ran a records check on him. There was no criminal record. He had several guns registered to him, the rifles and 22 caliber pistol he had mentioned, but there was another, a 357 Magnum. We talked to him about weapons. He omitted any mention of a 357 revolver. Investigators believe the murder weapon might have been a 357. Hey, Bill. Suspicion was settling over Charles Abbott. Then, another ominous lead. About three days into the investigation, a call came into our dispatch center. The caller told our dispatcher anonymously that Charles Abbott had solicited someone to have his wife killed. The caller gave a couple of different names. But each man named was incarcerated at the time of the murder. If Charles Abbott had tried to hire them, he was unsuccessful. Perhaps he found someone else to help him, or he did the job himself. After the December 1990 murder of Susan Abbott in Lodi, California, suspicion focused on her husband, Charles. 
the suspect had given Detective Sergeant Bill Berry a detailed account of his actions on the day Susan disappeared. It included going to the storage unit where he kept work equipment and renting a car for the day. Barry secured the records of the electronic card key system at the storage unit. It had, in fact, logged his partner who had come into the storage unit that morning and had left a few minutes later. But there was no record of Charles Abbott's card being used any time during that day. Next, the detective wanted to check the route Charles said he drove that day in the car he rented. We had gone over in some detail his movements during that day, and we had done that twice. Barry had turn-by-turn -turn directions. A simple check on Charles's alibi was to drive the route with the rental car and to check that mileage from that route against what was on the rental agreement. We saw that that did not match up, that there was a substantial discrepancy between the two. Charles Abbott's alibi was crumbling, but investigators needed hard evidence to prove he was involved in Susan's murder. Lodi police crime scene technicians carefully processed the dumpster where the victim's purse was found. We ultimately found household trash, a, a toothpaste tube box atop to a napkin box, items which didn't really fit uh, what we would have expected to find. More significantly than that, we found bloody towels. The technicians also recovered the box to a bar of soap and the top to a tissue box. Uncertain which of these items might prove important to the case, investigators marked everything and collected it for later study in the crime lab. The towels that we found in the dumpster were stained with blood, and there was also hair adhering to them. An examination of the blood found it to be O positive, which was a match for Susan's blood type. And the hair was found to be, under microscopic examination, consistent with samples of Susan's hair. Police finally had enough circumstantial evidence to get a warrant to search the Abbott house. If it was Susan's blood on the towels, they might have come from the house. The murder might have taken place there. Officers removed Charles Abbott from the house, standard procedure for a search. They placed him in protective custody so the scene could be completely processed. We're gonna have you stand by here until we conduct They were looking for blood, ballistics, the murder weapon, anything that would show where Susan was shot. In the bedroom, technicians discovered minute specks of blood. They were on a wall near the bed, almost invisible to the naked eye. The technicians knew that blood spatter that tiny meant it came from a high-velocity spray, often seen in gunshot cases. They also noticed something on the floor of the bedroom, a lead fragment, likely the jacket of a large-caliber like bullet. Yeah, that looks like that looks like it could be a large caliber too. I mean, that's yeah. quite a bit of jacket. Yeah, it looks it like possibly a hollow point round. Police believe yeah. a 357 was used to kill Susan. In the dresser, they discovered a wallet containing Susan Abbott's credit cards, cards that Charles said had been taken from her purse. Okay. We'll do. All right, thanks. In the bathroom, investigators found more incriminating evidence. We found a number of towels in the house. We recognized the patterns as being similar to the ones that we had found in the dumpster. We went and got the towels from the dumpster and compared the two and found that, that they were an exact match. In the trash, they recovered more of Susan's credit cards. Evidence technicians swabbed the drain of the bathtub they discovered traces of human blood. Investigators knew the body had bled out before it was dumped, and the body's position had indicated it was in a confined space, like a bathtub.
Investigators still hope to find the murder weapon. We obtained search warrants for Charles's storage unit because once we had searched the house, we still had not located the gun. And the storage unit was an obvious location where it might be. As we searched the storage unit, we came across a number of items that uh, were very significant to us. There was no gun, but officers did find a box of 357 caliber ammunition. It was a box of 50, and there were six missing. We knew that the weapon that was likely used was a 357. So there was some potential that these rounds obviously were the ones that were used to load the weapon. The investigators also discovered information on dating services, including correspondence with mail order brides. They recalled Charles had said his marriage was a solid one. When we found those materials, it indicated to us quite the opposite, that he was interested in pursuing relationships with other women. Additionally, the officers found leaflets for get-rich-quick schemes and other documents that showed Charles Abbott was having financial difficulties. And this, of course, played into the possible motivation that uh, collecting life insurance might be a motive for him to commit this crime. To strengthen their case, investigators wanted to try and match the top of the tissue box found in the dumpster to the tissue box taken from the Abbott house. Using a comparison microscope, a trained examiner like Donald Morian can see if the minute fibers match up side by side. You have to examine it microscopically to look at the way the fibers of the actual box, the paper fibers, cross. You have to match those fibers up uh, to uh, generally say that this, yes, this piece of top was a part of this box originally. One shot killed Susan Abbott. Investigators wanted to know what kind of gun fired that shot. Forensic tests on the bullet fragments found in the bedroom were consistent with one fired from a 357 Magnum, a gun Charles Abbott owned but could not produce for police. Although police never found the murder weapon, they now believed they had enough evidence to prove Charles Abbott killed his wife. He was arrested and tried for murder. In June of 1992, District Attorney Thomas Testa presented the jury what the evidence showed happened on December 16, 1990. The night Susan Abbott was murdered, from all the evidence we believe, Charles Abbott went behind her, put his gun to her head, and pulled the trigger and shot her through the head, a contact wound to the back of the head. He then took her body into the bathroom, into the bathtub, and let it bleed out in that bathtub. Put new clothes on the body, new red, bright, visible clothes. Took her body out and laid her body out, not under the railroad trestle where it would be hidden, but near the railroad trestle, but in an area where she would be visible in that bright red outfit because he wanted her to be found. She had to be found in order for him later to collect the insurance. Charles Abbott was charged and convicted of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. That's gonna look like when a killer's yeah. deceit masks the crime, police must turn to forensic experts to decipher the truth written in blood.